Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 483. Buying on a Whim. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff examines the gaming potential of the Electoral College, Jackie breaks down worker placement games, and we present a new segment on the developmental potential of board gaming on children. Plus, Tom looks at the latest Civilization game, we have a tale of board gaming horror, some questions from the mailbag, and we discuss whether we've ever purchased a game not knowing anything about it. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Ben Zobrist of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Go Cubs, go! Yes, you are definitely that sports guy there. Hey, well, this is actually like two weeks after they've won, but congratulations to the Cubs. I think I think the folks in Chicago are still partying at this point. I think so. Well, they 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 have a lot of mileage they can get out of this. <laughs> yes, um, they do. So, all right. Well, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. And yeah, we're here to talk about board games. Hey, in our last episode, I talked about episode 500 and thereafter and a contest. And you can go back and listen to that, but don't forget to enter that contest. And that's pretty much all we'll say about that. And that's all I got to say about that. All you got to say. So we're going to just jump right into some games here because Eric has finally played the most hyped game of 2016. You thought that was last time when he talked about Scythe? This one's been hyped even more. It has. and But it's funny because uh, – so so this is Mechs versus Minions, uh, which I finally had a chance to play at uh, Falcon, uh, which was a local Connecticut convention. I took my son there. We had a blast. Um, but I, I tweeted about it at the time. I said, I'm finally playing catch-up and playing Mechs versus Minions. And somebody replied and said, they just shipped it this week. It's just because in this sphere that I operate in, it seems like everyone I know is is like a media personality, and they all got early copies of this thing. Anyway, uh, Mechs versus Minions is a gorgeous-looking uh, cooperative game, minis game, uh, that that's scenario-based. You sort of work your way through folders and, uh, you know, scenario books. And uh, I got to play something in the middle. It was like the first time the boss character comes out. So there's there's stuff. You unlock packets, and it's all fully reversible, but you you sort of learn the game as you go, and they keep adding more modules to the game as you as you work through them. And this is the first time that a box gets opened in this giant, gorgeous-looking package. And out comes this big dude um, boss character. And uh, the, the object of the game is to knock out the boss or to uh, achieve whatever objective is, is in this particular game. And you are programming your moves uh, as, with your individual mech. And, uh, and you do this through the drafting of cards. So you will draft cards, and there's a time limit to this. You have to decide very quickly which cards you're going to draft. Uh, and you, you need, I need this card, I need this card, I really want a green card, I need a turn, I need a move forward, I need an attack. And so you, you decide who's getting what card, and then you put them in one of six slots on your mat. And you don't get all six cards at once, so you may only get one or two at the beginning, I think you get two at the beginning. And then you can leave room before or after those cards so that you can maneuver later. You can take damage in those slots. So now that particular plan is messed up until you heal or repair that particular section. And you're trying to knock out the minions that are nearby and complete whatever whatever objectives you have. In this case, it was destroying the boss. Um, and as you destroy minions, the little guys, you sort of power up your team. Every five or six of them levels up your team, which unlocks more abilities for your team. And uh, the boss in this scenario we played had his own track, program track, and we had to draft abilities for him to get. Like every turn, we revealed two nasty cards. Which of these two nasty cards do you want? Uh, I guess we'll give him a quadra beam instead of having him explode every turn. Um, and, and hopefully take this guy down 
uh, as a team before things get totally terrible. The pieces are gorgeous. The packaging is gorgeous. Uh, and the game is very fun as well. It's, it's a little chaotic. Uh, there's a lot of dice rolling. There's a lot of uh, the minions flowing in different directions and moving around in unexpected ways. Uh, so you can't necessarily plan that far in advance, knowing that you're, it's not quite robo-rally in the sense that I know I'm going to be here, and after this, the conveyor belts are going to turn me here. No, it, you, you can't really plan. Uh, you can try, and then stuff's going to happen, and maybe you, you succeed later. And then it's very, it's very tactical as opposed to strategic. But it's a blast, and I could see playing this with my kids um, I think they would enjoy this tremendously, and this is another one I didn't want to put it on my wish list, but yes, there it goes. Of course, I've missed the first print run, but uh, something tells me they're going to make another one. I liked it a lot. Mechs versus Minions, thumbs up. Yeah, I'm, I'm really kind of happy about this one because when it, when it first came out, everyone said, oh, yeah, this is all hype, this is this, that, that. But now that it's out, people are agreeing, right? It really is a fun game, and it's kind of hitting everybody because... It's not – you look at it, you're like, oh, miniatures game. Like, I bet, Eric, it doesn't look like your style of game, really, at, at a glance. No, it, it, it probably wouldn't be. Yeah. But you liked it anyway. I so. did. And the, and the pieces are gorgeous. I mean, you, you look at these. These minis are gor- – <laughs> they're, they're very, very pretty. All right, I'm going to talk about Four Gods. This is from Christopher Bollinger, who did Dungeon Twister and a whole bunch of other games. He makes interesting games. Uh, and Four Gods is Speed Simultaneous Carcassonne. Ooh. That's pretty much what it is. It's a board, and you each start with it. it, it you have a hand, two hands, okay? And in each hand you have I'm, – I'm glad we clarified the two hands thing. Yes. But uh, in each hand you have a tile that you draw from the bag, and they're double-sided tiles, and they have different combinations of sea, forest, plains, and mountains on them. And then you say go, and then everyone's just taking turns simultaneously. And so – you can put a tile in the corners of this frame uh, because every tile must touch two straight edges. So first you put in the corner, but then you can build off these corners. But they have to – the first one you can put in the corner because the corner doesn't matter. But after that, they have to match to different sides as you put them together. And so once you have tiles out of your hand, you can draw two more tiles and keep going. If you don't like the tiles in your hand, you can put them in front of you in these like reserve slots. Uh, but you only have so many reserve slots. So eventually you have to grow, come back and grab these and get them out on the board. At some point, you want to grab a god, and the followers of that god prophets uh, one of four different colors that match the four different terrain types. And you place those. When you put a tile out, you put it in that terrain type. And scoring for a terrain type at the end, let's say we have a forest area that's six tiles big. And Eric has two uh, of his yellow prophets in it, and I have one blue prophet. Eric gets the points for it. But we have three prophets in it, so that means there's only three tiles without prophets. So he gets three points. Hmm. So the bigger the area is and the fewer people in it, the more points it's worth. But the bigger an area of people in, probably the more people you're going to put in it as time goes by. You also will score if Eric picks the yellow and then the planes at the end of the game, the biggest plane area. Whoever has the biggest area of their color will get bonus points. And whoever has the most areas of their color will get bonus points. And there's a few other things. You can put cities out that get you points. But if someone can find a tile that can completely replace a city, they'll get the points rather than you. And so it's good. But it's again, it's it, it's 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 like speedy but thoughtful at the same time. Like, oh, let's put these tiles out. But the the, the game is super quiet; no one's talking at all <laughs> because you're looking at the tile. And you're like, uh, uh, where does this one fit? This doesn't fit anywhere. I don't think. Okay, okay, put it down. Grab another one. Uh, okay, this one doesn't fit anywhere. And then you keep doing that. And so, I think it's one of those games that's like, oh, that's interesting. And who does that appeal to? People who like to play Carcassonne really fast. <laughs> yep. Oh, well, that's not a huge Venn diagram of people. So I like it. I didn't love it. Um, but I don't know. And, and you could play without the speed. Like you can just – you have a timer. And Eric, it's your turn to put tiles out. Here's your timer. Da, 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 30 seconds up. Next person. Although that still isn't like that much less stressful. Um, I don't think this game is for everybody. But if what I just said sounds interesting, you'll like Four Gods. Okay. Not Alone is a You're game by... not like, alone. Not alone. That's how you should say it. Uh, it's a game from Geek Attitude Games. It's a sci-fi theme. It's a one versus many game. One player is the creature, and the others are the hunted. And uh, they have crash-landed on a planet, 
And the creature is trying to assimilate those people into the ecosystem of the planet to get them to stay because it loves them. The hunted are trying to hold out long enough to be rescued. There's a track uh, in the center of the table, and uh, there's, there's two little pawns. One's the creature, one is the hunted, and whichever one makes it to the center first wins because they've either been rescued or assimilated by the planet. Now, the mechanism is sort of a hide-and-seek system. There are ten cards representing locations on the planet. And every hunted player, will uh, they, you, they start out with only the first five of those locations, one through five. Uh, and they play one of them face down. And then the creature takes their alien token and puts it on one of those five locations. Also playing cards that can have them place a second token, do other special effects, peek at cards, all sorts of stuff. And then you reveal, and if the creature caught if they're in the same place as one of the hunted, then those hunted players lose a will token. You've got three of those at the beginning of the game. Uh, and if you run out of those, you will move, the, the creature gets to move their token one step closer to the center of the board. You can, uh, and then after you've, you've uh, if you didn't get found by the creature, you can activate the power of that particular location, which allows you to draw more location cards. So now you might have one through five and seven in your hand, uh, which gives you more options, more places to hide, more abilities to trigger. Uh, you can also replenish your hand, because that's the primary mechanism here. When you played a card, a location card, you don't just automatically get it back into your hand. You have to either trigger a location that lets you draw those back, or at the beginning of your turn, you can spend your will tokens to regain cards into your hand, or simply give up, allowing the creature to move you one space closer to being captured. And, but then get all of your cards back. And so you're constantly playing hide-and-seek uh, as you get to the last couple of spaces before... Oh, yes, at the end of each round, uh, the good guys, the, the hunted, move one more space closer to rescue. So it's simply a turn-by-turn -turn, uh, you know, timer for them. There's also a way to move that timer forward and one of the locations, but that makes it one of the most popular locations so you know that the creature is going to be visiting there a good bit. You, uh, you continue playing until one team is rescued, uh, either rescued or, or assimilated, and, uh, and that's the winner. Now, this is primarily designed as a multiple players against the creature, but I played it as a two-player game and was worried about how well it would work, but it actually worked very well. It was tense the whole time. Uh, there was a lot of uh, paying attention to what the... I was playing the creature and, uh, and watching what the hunted player had played. There are cards that had me making them discard cards before they were able to play them, limiting the number of options, trying to guess between three or four options where they would be, playing action cards that let me place multiple tokens. It was really neat. I thought I was overpowered, but they were able to be wily enough to avoid me and get close enough to rescue before I could, uh, you know, seal the deal and assimilate them into the planet. There was some tension. I'm, I'm interested to play this with a larger group. I think I really need to try the many in this one versus many format. But as a two-player game, it worked very well as well. And that's not alone from Geek Attitude Games. Yeah, you know, when I explained this game to somebody else, they said to me, oh, that's, that's kind of like Four Corners, the board game. And I was like, oh, I guess, except in Four Corners. I don't know if you've ever played Four Corners, Eric. No. As a kid, where everyone would run to a corner and then someone would shout out South and then everyone in South Corner was out of the game. Yeah, okay, yes. Right. So it's, it's, it's kind of like that, but there's actually more to it than that. It's like, okay, it's... I think you're going to go here, but you know I think you're going to yes. go here. Yes. Oh, it's got so that. Therefore... And and it's it's interesting. Now, I don't think the game is great. I, I I was really surprised. Like this was super hot on Board Game Geek for a while. I mean, super hot. Hmm. But I think it's unique and interesting. It's kind of a reverse thing. It, it's it's not it's not, you know, most of these games everybody's hunting one person. I like that this one's the opposite. Right. One person's coming after everybody else. So it's very intriguing, and I, I don't know. I, I also enjoy this one a, a lot. That is not alone. Seafall. Oh, you finished? <sighs> yes, but not in the way that you think. Oh. We decided we were done. Okay. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But what happened is, and I'm not going to spoil it up, but something we opened. 
the second last box and found an unbelievably cool idea was in that box, right? Hmm. And we were really excited about that because we're like, okay, this is going to change the game up, and it just didn't. It was a neat idea, and it was a neat concept, but when we went through one more long, boring game with it, uh, I said, all right, everyone, we need to vote on this because we play a lot of games, and are we going to dedicate another 10 games to this? We've already played seven. You know, seven, that's 20 hours into one board game. Do mm-hmm. we want to keep doing it? And the answer was no. So uh, we then opened, we, we, we tried to, we like speed play, played through the rest of the game. Like, okay, if I did this and this and this and this and this okay. and this, okay, that's how that opens. That's how this happens. And the final stuff was pretty impressive, amazing, cool, neat stuff. But I'm not sure I would have wanted to play through 15 three-hour games to, to get to get it. there. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, I have my copy. I have not yet found a group to play it with. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, just at the rate you took to play Pandemic, I think this will take you years to play through. Maybe. I, I, I'm trying to get like a, a dedicated every week, every two weeks sort of system going. We'll see. Yeah, and this is not going to be like Pandemic Legacy. Well, I, I think when you play Pandemic Legacy, you occasionally play two games in a row. Yes. Yeah, you won't do that in this one, I don't think. I think you'll play a game and go, okay, we'll play next week. Whether you like it or not, I think the game's this is not a binge-style game mm-hmm. at all. And we didn't even do that. I don't think we ever played. We played the prologue in the first game in a row, and that was it. Um, but, yeah, my final rating on it is a five. Unfortunately, huh? That's disappointing I, I after really, all that hype. Well, you know, here's the deal, though. Okay, even though I'm saying that, and most of the other reviewers have agreed with me, now that the game is out there, lots of people are saying they really enjoy it. Hmm. So, I guess, um, you know, it is what it is. You know, yeah. maybe someone else, maybe other people like it more than we do, and so, and that's fine. If you love it, that's amazing. I, I so I hope, I hope you do like it, Eric. Me too. Because then that will <laughs> well, what but I mean, I don't sit there and be like, you'll see, Eric. Nope, there's a good chance you might enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So that's my final thoughts on on Seafall. Okay. Here's another nautical themed game. It's called Octodice. This is the uh dice uh, dice game in the world of Aquasphere. Uh, this edition was put out by Tasty Minstrel Games. Th- this is one of the games we we signed up for on the first night of Falcon. Um, it is, uh, so you got your dice and they come in two it's, flavors. It's very little, it's very, to be clear, be clear, it's based in the world of Aquasphere, but other than that, I don't really think they're very similar at all. Right. I think the, the primary similarity is that it involves the octopods, uh, the sort of octopus creatures, which I, I haven't played Aquasphere, so I just know they exist. I don't know what they do in Aquasphere. But anyway, in Octo Dice, uh, you've got two flavors of dice. Uh, one, the let's see, it's the white. No, the the black dice have some colors and some numbers on them, um, and as well as an octopod on one of the faces. And then the white dice have symbols on five of the faces and an octopod on one of those faces. And when you have a turn, you will roll all six dice and pick two of those dice to set aside. And then roll the remaining four, pick two of those dice to set aside, roll the remaining two, and then from that collection of six, you will pair up a white die and a black die to do an action. And the, the five symbols correspond to sections of your board, and there's, there's one symbol that just earns you straight up points in sort of a graduating scale uh, based on the colors that you, you've matched up. So if you, you have that symbol and a yellow at first, it's worth a small number of points. But then if you get that symbol and a red, then that's worth more points. And if you can do that whole sequence, great. Uh, there's another one that just gives you points based on what the number is that you pair it up with. Then there's some submarines and some robots. And you can sort of tick those off and they'll give you points at the end of each round which is great for each robot that you have riding a particular submarine. So the more of those you're able to line up, like the blue submarine with two blue robots, great, two points every round. Uh, And then you can upgrade different technologies, which give you more scoring opportunities when you trigger different abilities. You play a total of six rounds, uh, and each round you are also allowed to follow two other people's dice, uh, that, that give you more opportunities to get actions taken care of. So really, it's like 
Uh, so four actions with six actions total uh, that you'll get to take. And then you do a little scoring. And then you do another six actions and scoring and six actions and scoring. Uh, you also have to f- see those octopods. If you are able to, to score two octopods each round, you avoid a negative score and also earn yourself points. Uh, but if you don't see two octopods each scoring round, you're going to lose two points. And you're filling out your score sheet, triggering things, following other people's dice, and eventually you, you total up the score uh, and the most points wins. My son, I was a little worried when we first got the explanation and seeing how all of these symbols were going to work. Uh, and I thought maybe he was going to glaze over and not quite get it. But he, he did quite well and we tied uh, at the end of the game. He, he, uh, there's no tiebreaker, which was a little annoying. But the, um, we rejoiced in our shared victory in Octodice. I, this isn't a run out and purchase sort of thing. But it was a good time. I liked it. The, the big complaint is that the Tasty Minstrel version, the black dice and the purple octopods are virtually impossible to distinguish from each other. So it just looks like a blank face on the die unless you look really closely. But it's a minor annoyance because it's the only blank face on the die. It was good. I'm not running out to get it. That's octodice. Yeah, the thing is there's a lot of these games out there nowadays. There's a lot of these dice games that add this sort of thing. Like the new one from Stronghold Games, La Grania, uh, Siesta, or something like that. Yeah, no that Siesta. One is, no Siesta. That one's way better than Octo Dice. Oh, really? Okay. So, you know, when there's so many games out there that are so similar, these dice games don't really usually diverge that much. Um, but speaking of dice games, Star Wars Destiny. Ah, uh, yes. I finally got my hands on the final copy of this. This is the dice card game based in Star Wars, which people are going to yell about for the next year because it's collectible. <laughs> yeah. Right? The starter decks are set. You can buy uh, – it's uh, Kylo Ren and a Stormtrooper versus uh, Ray and Finn. Uh, there's two starter decks, one for the good guys, one for the bad guys. And mm-hmm. then there's booster packs where you get cards and dice. And in these booster packs, they got people from all the Star Wars movies. And they I mean not now? just – not just episode seven and, you know, there's stuff like that and, and the original ones, but Count Dooku's in it and different people from the the trilogy that everyone always loves to hate on. Hmm. So I'm cool with that because I like all these movies anyway. So uh, it has these different characters. And so you build you, – you bring out a certain number of characters that equal 30 points. It's two or three characters. And then you have a small deck of cards, 30 cards. And then you're just going to – Roll dice that these characters bring. Each character will bring some dice with them. Uh, as the game goes by, you'll get cards that you can put on these characters that might give them more dice to roll. And then you use the symbols that you roll on these dice to attack your opponent. But it's very much action. I take an action. You take an action. I take an action. So I might. my first action might be I'm going to tap uh, Kylo Ren and I get to roll his two dice. So I roll his two dice. Okay, now it's your turn to take an action. Then it comes back to me and I'm like, okay. Well, one of his dice show a uh, melee attack of two. I'm going to use that melee attack of two. But since I've already rolled the Stormtroopers die and he also has a melee attack, I'm going to use both of them at the same time and hit uh, Finn for, you know, three damage. And then, then my next turn, I'm going to pay some resources and play this card for my hand, which brings another card out on the table, uh, which has a die with it. Or maybe some cards that just do different actions. So each... Each booster pack comes with five more cards and one die. These dice are big, chunky dice that look like they have stickers on, but they're not. They're printed (laughs) on the dice and then, like, schlacked on or something. They're not going to come off anytime soon. I really like the game. I really do. I I don't think the game is deep, and I said that in my video review and got beset upon by a a horde of fans of the game. (laughs) Uh, But I still don't think it's a deep game. I mean, maybe it is, but it feels Star Wars, and I like that. I mean, there's cards like I got a Stormtrooper, and now I got an, uh, an, an ATSD, and I'm using that ATSD with that Stormtrooper to attack you. And, and oh, BB 8 shows up here, and then he lets me re roll one of my dice, and all these different things. And there's special abilities, but it's really simple. The rules are two pages. Um, I think the biggest detractor is obviously going to be uh, that it's collectible, and you really are going to need to buy a good chunk of booster packs if you want to go beyond those starter decks. Mm-hmm. Like I got four booster packs, um, and yeah, there's not much I can use them with. There's a few cards I can stick in, but I need more stuff if I want to effectively use these in my in my game. So I don't know how many booster packs I'm going to buy because I really do like the game a lot. 
but I, I, I think it's a neat idea anyway. Hmm. So that's Star Wars Destiny. It is my favorite of these small Star Wars games, like the Star Wars Living Card game I thought was good. This one I think is much better than that. Um, I don't mind the collectability aspect because I don't need to own it all. I just get a bunch of stuff and play with it. But I think even the starter decks were fun to enjoy. So that's Star Wars Destiny. This this might be one, if my son didn't despise Star Wars for some ridiculous reason, I, this would be a good choice for for a holiday gift, I think, for him. Wait, does he does he despise it? He does. It's I don't know. It's weird. I it's he's like way over the edge and not liking it. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. It we'll fix it. <laughs> okay, well, that's fine. You don't have to like Star Wars. We'll fix it. It's fine. It's, don't worry. We're working. I, on it. I'm not worried. Okay, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, so we we touched on this game, my last game, uh, a few weeks ago when Tom, you talked about the English version of Geister Geister something Meister. Um, and you, you had, it's like a something Treasure Hunters. It's Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Ghost I have it on my shelf. Treasure Hunters. I but love this game. We discussed that there was a Ghostbusters version coming, and that is Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. This is from Mattel. It's available as a mass market game. Uh, very skinny little box, uh, but it is, it is based off the new movie. So you've got the four female Ghostbusters, uh, and there's a Rowan figure who is the villain from the, that film. Um, but... I've been I've been told that the board is almost identical. This is a cooperative game. You are trying to get eight paranormal devices out of a hotel. And they're all spread out in different rooms at the beginning of the game. There are some ghosts that start out at the beginning of the game. And uh, you roll a die that, that shows how far your pawn can move. It also shows you whether or not you're drawing a card. Five out of the six faces on the die will have you drawing a card. You draw a card. It tells you where to place a ghost. Uh, if you have already two ghosts in an area, you will remove those ghosts and put out a haunter figure, a large green-tinged ghost. And if you get six of those guys out, you've lost. Uh, the ghosts are relatively easy to deal with. You roll a die, and I think 50% of the results will get rid of one of those ghosts. Yay! If you have a haunter, however, you need to have two of the Ghostbusters in the room and roll that die, and only one of the six faces gets rid of the haunter. But you get to roll once for each of the Ghostbusters that are in the room and hopefully get rid of those haunters. Uh, If you are holding a paranormal device, because you can pick them up, and it's kind of cool because they have backpacks, and so you pick up the little token and you stick it in their backpack, and now they're carrying that token out of the building. The object is to get them all out, but if you're carrying one and a haunter shows up in your room or you walk into a haunter, you are trapped there until you can bust that haunter and then you can leave. So it's possible that if all of the Ghostbusters are holding the paranormal devices and they're all in separate rooms with haunters, you've locked up the game and you've lost. You also lose if all six haunters come out. Uh, The die rolls are pretty much going to run this game. Uh, If you are constantly rolling ones, you are not going to move quickly enough to actually deal with the ghosts. Or if you're never rolling the ghost symbols or the haunter symbols on the battle die, you're also never going to win. It's just the nature of this game. But it's very light. It plays extremely quickly. And I'm trying to figure out why I'm happy with this game as opposed to the game I talked about a couple weeks ago, the the hamster game bond a game where you're also rolling dice and if you roll terribly you're not going to win i think it's because there's more stuff going on here you got ghosts popping up and you're battling the ghosts and you're picking up stuff and you're moving in and out of the rooms and uh there's there's different levels of the game you can play uh with one ghost that can't be busted and is just moving around sort of filling up rooms and making it more difficult for you to clear them make them safe Uh, And then there's an advanced version where doors can be locked and opened and closed and they shuffle the deck more often. Uh, And the the paranormal devices need to be taken out of the building in order, in order for you to win. But I've barely, I've come close to winning on just the basic version. My son has won on the basic and then the semi-basic version. But for some reason, I feel I'm, I'm happy with this. I don't think it's just theme. I think it's that there's more things to do and more wheels turning in this game than there is in that hamster game. But I've really enjoyed Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. For a under $20 mass market game, it's, it's pretty well put together. The minis are cute. Uh, the little Ghostbuster pawns are cool. It's, you know, it's not, we're not talking Stronghold Games production or, uh, you know, any of the other hobby game publishers, but 
it's still pretty solid and and well put together, and it's based on a terrific game to begin with. Yeah, it's it's worth a look. If you're a fan of Ghostbusters, looking for a, a light co-op uh, that you can play with kids, my kids adore this and are playing it all the time. Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. Stronghold Games Production, that's your, like... I was, you know, I was for... floundering. They, they have good stuff. <laughs> They have good stuff, but I, I was thinking more like Kumani or Nod yeah, or, okay, you know, yes. or Matago production. Okay. Anyhow, I, I have Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters because I think the production of the game is much more superior. Yes, I know it's not as cheap, obviously. And there's one extra minor rule in the Ghostbusters version with that – with the main bad villain Ghost. With Rowan. Can use. Yeah. With Rowan. That's not in the original game. Other than that, they're really close to identical. Except the other one has a, you know, it's just a much nicer version of the game. But right. still, I think it's a cool cooperative game, despite the fact that it's basically using roll and move. Yeah. I think it's funny. The rules for Ghostbusters, at one point in the game, it refers to the paranormal devices as jewels. It's like it's one little piece of the rules that they forgot to update to Ghostbusters. That's I th- funny. I thought it was funny. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. All right. Well, last game I want to talk about is Blood Bowl, 5th edition, 4th edition. I will just say 2016 edition. Sure. Games Workshop has brought back Blood Bowl. This is one of those games that everyone has always said, Tom, you got to play Blood Bowl. All right. It's a football game in the future in the Warhammer 40,000 or Warhammer universe where dwarves are fighting, humans are fighting orcs in a football game where the object is basically to beat up the other team also. And that was a very unique idea when it came out, I'm sure. But in the last five years, we have so many other games that are in this exact same kind of setting. You know, it's a football game, but with fighting. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of curious about this one. Now, I did not put the miniatures together. Sam got it. But you do have to put the miniatures together in their new set. There are three pieces for each miniature, so that's not too bad. Well. I've done worse. Super Dungeon Explorer. (laughs) Um, There's only a couple of them. Do you rem- – no, the original Super Dungeon Explorer. I've put together the base set for Super Dungeon Explorer. Yeah, it was a pain. It Maybe. No, no maybes. But maybe, hey, if you didn't think it was a pain, then you'll like the new set. But okay. anyhow, you still got to put the miniatures together, and I still think Games Workshop's kind of missing the mark on this sort of stuff because, like, everyone else, the miniatures are put together. Why do I want to put miniatures together? Especially if it's just for a game where I'm essentially running around with football. But I digress. Uh, the game still has that 80s, 90s feel to it. It's a big luck fest. It's fun, but you are picking a character on your turn, and then you'll you'll make a maneuver with that character. And you can use every character on your side. You might run. You might try to tackle your opponent. They call it a block. But essentially these blocks, I think, are like you're punching and kicking with both hands with spikes on them. So that's what you want to call a block. Sure. <laughs> um, and you can knock them down. You can even kill them. I mean, literally take them out forever. Uh, and so you can do all these different actions. And then you can also pick the ball up and pass the ball and such. However, if you ever mess up on one of these plays, there are certain, certain actions that if you mess up, instantly it becomes the other person's turn. Hmm. It's like a turnover. So you got to try to think out which ones you want to do first. And there's definitely strategy. And I'm sure someone who's good at the game would absolutely destroy me. The, the base game comes with humans versus orcs. Humans are faster. Orcs are stronger. That's basically the difference. But there's extra players that you'll be able to add. You can throw a troll on your team and have you know special players show up on your team. And more teams are coming. I know dwarves and skaven, they're, they're like giant rats, are coming. Hmm. And so I liked it. It was good for a lark. I don't think it was amazing. It was, it was fine. You know, um, I don't play enough of these football games to really compare it to too many of them. I just know that there's a lot of them out there. Uh, so I thought it was it was an interesting game. I'd like to maybe try it with like some more long, longevity in it. You know, play a campaign and see where that ends up. But that's Blood Bowl, the hmm. 2016 edition. Cool. Unless it comes out in January, in which case it would be the 2017 edition. Let's just call it the new version. That's right. All right, let's go to school and then to vote. This is Max Davey with Developing Games. Now, I'm a paediatrician by profession, specialising in developmental problems, also a dad and also an obsessive board gamer. I want to bring these elements together in these segments to explore the relationship between board games and child development. But in the first one, I want to explain what we know so far about this relationship and why it's maybe not as much as we should. 
We know that play is crucial to child development. This is particularly true in the under fives, where the best play is free form, imaginative, and child led. As the child gets over, older rather, <laughs> play gets more structured naturally and, and more rules based. At the same time, schools limit the access to play in favour of academic work, and increasingly in the modern era, parents limit the ability of kids to just roam around the neighbourhood as perhaps they used to. So this creates a kind of play void, which is increasingly filled by video games, because after all, the urge to play is still there. Now, I have nothing against video games as such, but I do worry that they offer quite a narrow play experience without the opportunity for imagination, social interaction and flexible problem solving that offline play offers. Board games ought to be perfectly positioned to step into this void. They're social, stimulating and structured enough that you can develop skills by playing them. But we know very little from research about the benefits and what we know is not 100% encouraging. Partly because what little research has been done has mainly been done on the educational benefits of educational games. And the problem with educational games, as most ta Dice Tower listeners will tell you, is that they are not fun. If you're not having fun playing a game, you're not engaged and therefore you won't be getting whatever benefits might accrue. Unfortunately, even if you trialled a great game, you might not be particularly pleased by the results. Say you get a load of 10 year olds, teach them pandemic, get them to play it and then measure their ability to plan and cooperate. This may come as a shock to you, but some of them won't like the game. No game works for every child, just like no game works for every grown up. And so what you'll do is you get a random group, some will like it and probably benefit, but others will not. And so your overall results will be diluted. There may be other approaches you can try, like splitting the group in half and giving half of them a games library so they can pick things that suit them, kind of in their sweet spot, not too challenging, but interesting enough. But the problem is the more real world or situation, the messier the data gets and harder it is to get results. So it's not easy to know what to do about this. And maybe the Dice Tower community has the answer. They seem to usually. So we need to be a bit careful. But I do think that from all my experience as a dad, as a paediatrician, as a, someone who runs a lot of game groups, that there are aspects of board games that can help certain children at a certain time with certain skills. And what I hope to do in the next few segments is explore the different aspects of development and what aspects of games might be beneficial. I look forward to seeing you there. My name is Max Davey with Developing Games. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. As I'm recording this, it is still before Election Day here in the U.S. I'm guessing that by the time this airs, the election will be over. Now, it does seem like the election cycle gets longer and longer every time, but let me add to the media coverage a wee bit more and talk about the presidential election system here in the U.S. But I don't want to talk about the candidates. I want to talk about the process. For those of you that aren't aware... Here in the United States, we don't actually vote for president. It may seem like it, but we actually vote for people to something called the Electoral College. Those folks then cast votes for president. Now, the founders set it up that way because they were concerned about the rise of factions that have narrow interests being able to game the system. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton warned against what they called, quote, the mischief of factions. Now, the idea with them was that the Electoral College would act as a buffer for cooler heads, giving them time to carefully consider the qualifications of those running for president. Now, originally, the electors were voted on district by district. Each state got a certain number of electors based on the size of the state, with smaller states getting an extra boost. But they were chosen or voted for individually, not the entire state like it is now. But quickly, the states realized that if they switched to a statewide system of awarding electors, a winner-takes-all system, they would have more power in selecting who ultimately became president and thus gain more influence over the process. 
candidates would campaign in the states more and all the good stuff that comes with it. Now, there was a wave of states that changed their rules so that all the electors of a state would be bound to vote for the same candidate. And Madison and Hamilton were seriously not happy about this. Hamilton actually drafted a constitutional amendment in 1802, mandating that electors be voted on in individual districts only. Madison tried the same thing in 1820, and both failed. By the 1830s, just about all the states switched to a system where it was winner takes all, a situation which remains to this day, except in Maine and Nebraska, which kept the original district model. Okay, so games... This show is about games. What does this story have to do with gaming? Well, switching the selection of electors to statewide winner-takes-all changed the game of how to get elected president. It turned it into an area-majority game, like El Grande. Area-majority games are all about efficiency. Having 10 cubes in an area while your opponent has zero is okay in one sense, since you get the points for the space, but it is very bad in another sense, because if you only had one cube there, you still would have gotten five points, and those nine cubes could be doing something else somewhere else. Now, by design, area majority games force the players to focus on the areas that are close. Those are the spots where your strength has the most leverage. Let's say you have two cubes to put on the board. Putting them in a space where you're ahead 4-0 or behind 4-0 makes no sense. You want to put them where the current balance is 4-3. to three. Now, area majority games force players to focus on efficiency and to use their strength in tipping point areas, areas where things can be swung one way or the other. And this is exactly what we say in the U.S. presidential elections. The candidates spend all of their time in so-called swing states, the states where the vote is really close. In Maryland, Clinton has a 61 to 33 lead over Trump. In Wyoming, Trump has a 63 to 27 lead over Clinton. Neither candidate is campaigning in either of those states. The nature of the game forces them, if they want to win, to focus very narrowly. Think how different the campaign would be if it was simply who got the most votes. Then the candidates would be incentivized to get out every last vote, even in places like Maryland and Wyoming. Getting every voter engaged, not just those in swing states, would be vitally important. Would this be better? I'm not sure. It would certainly subject all of us, not just you poor souls in Florida and Ohio, to endless barrages of TV ads. It would make the campaigns even more expensive than they are now, which would make it harder for grassroots candidates to rise and increase the importance of money in the elections. Perhaps most importantly, the Electoral College helps create a firewall for close votes. In the 2000 election, Bush and Gore were separated by only a few hundred votes in Florida, perhaps even fewer, and that decided the election. As much of a circus as that was, if a strictly national election was that close, it would be potentially devastating. With every vote across the nation being scrutinized, a country would be paralyzed. Having a state-by-state winner-takes-all system isolates close votes to a small portion of the nation. Now, when developing the Constitution, Madison and Hamilton intended that we use a third way, the individual district system, divide the country into 538 districts and have a simple majority vote in each. Of course, that would lead to an insane gerrymandering problem, but maybe it's worth a shot. The point here is that rules matter a lot. The rules of the election game determine not just how it's played, but the type of candidates and elected leaders that it produces. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round, children. I grew up an only child in the late 70s, early 80s. I didn't have much interest in board games initially, but I did have interest in fantasy settings. My mom, for some reason, bought me the game Dark Tower. I was blown away. This eventually led me to getting Dungeon and other games I have long since forgotten. Of course, as an only child, I rarely had opportunities to play. I always tried to convince my parents, but my dad quickly dismissed me. I hate board games. You only teach me enough rules to play, then pull a random rule out at the last minute which lets you win, was his usual response. So I was left to play with my mom. And eventually, as I grew older, I finally found friends who would play these games, D&D, and others. Fast forward to 2011, when I rediscovered board games. 
My girls at the time were seven and four, and when I learned about all the newer games that were coming out, I was all in. It was a great way for our family to connect in person. Five years later, we're all gamers to some degree, and my collection has grown to a staggering size. Meanwhile, my dad retired and wanted to be around his family. I had moved across the country, and he timidly asked if he could move close enough to us that he could regularly spend time with his grandkids. I agreed, of course, and he now routinely comes on Wednesdays for dinner and a general good time with a lot of laughs. But the games have been infectious. My kids constantly talk about how cool some of them are, especially games that offer something unique, legacy games, storytelling games, etc. But it falls on deaf ears with my dad. Your father used to teach me enough rules to play, then pull a random rule out at the last minute which let him win, he would say, after all of these years. My kids would plead with him. If Dad did that in the past, he doesn't anymore. He teaches games and loses all the time. I'd smile, knowing it was wasted effort on their part, but I appreciated them trying. But then it happened. He broke. I'll tell you what, next time you come to the house, I'll play a board game with you guys. I felt I had to record the conversation. I was excited. The holidays were coming up, and we usually go to his house for a night or two in the mountains. Usually we'd just game while he did other things, but now he wanted to be a part of it. So the holidays came, and we loaded our Ikea bag with the usual assortment of games the four of us wanted to play. Then came the selection. Easy to learn, short rules, player conflict with the potential of player elimination. We all agreed. King of Tokyo. When it came time to play, I questioned him one last time. You really want to do this? He replied. I said I would, let's do this. I proceeded to set up all the pieces for King of Tokyo, explaining things as I went, purposely quizzing my family on the rules as I explained, to give him confidence that I was teaching it correctly. We began, and I couldn't have wished it better. Even without my dad, our games tend to be aggressive, with the winner being the last one standing more often than the number of stars. It was an even battle. Dice were flying. Good-natured smack talk was going on with my younger child yelling Booyah! at a great roll with lots of claws. Everyone was laughing. And what's this? My dad was smiling the whole time. Years of emotion came flooding out. I was almost teary with the memories of my attempts to get my dad engaged with the hobby. Not just recently, but back in the day. This was a success. Amazingly, it was a stand-up finish. My one daughter and dad were battling final roles against each other to determine the winner. And my dad won. Everyone yelled. It was a great moment. Not trying to push a good thing, I suggested we get a bite to eat. In agreement, I started to pack the game up. And that was when my heart sank. Tokyo Bay, the five to six player spot. Oh no. See, when I taught my family the game years prior, I ignored explaining the five to six player space. There was no point. Our game group is the four of us. Why teach young kids a rule they will never use? But here we were with my dad, five players. I taught the rules wrong. And since it was an aggression-heavy game, it could have made the difference. True, my dad won, but if he ever found out, I would never live it down. Now, months later, I still haven't told my immediate family about the error. My kids would find it hilarious and tell my dad immediately. We've at least expanded our gaming with my dad, 
Cash and Guns, Evolution, Colt Express, but he always comes back to King of Tokyo. And every time I set it up, I worry about the day when he asks, So what's the deal with this Tokyo Bay spot? <laughs> so this is a tale of possible future horror? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a foreboding thing. Although I've got your answer. You, you can just say, oh, that was, uh, that's an expansion. Uh, so yeah, I think we can probably play the advanced game. What do you think, kids? Yeah, from, from now on, <laughs> you're, you're pretty good at it. I mean, you've won five or six times now. So let's just say that when we have five players, the Tokyo Bay's open. There you go. Simple solution. I think you're fine. I think this is a tale of uh, success, really. But yeah, you did screw up, just so you know. Eric, Eric, teaching what? people to be deceptive. <laughs> mm. I think it's an I excellent solution. All right. Let's learn about worker placement. Let's get under the hood and see what makes one of our favorite games tick with a board game biopsy. Welcome everyone to Gaming Biopsy. I'm Jackie. Recently on Board Game Geek, a user complained that all worker placements resemble each other. After all, he said, this mechanism has been overused so far, and so isn't it time to move to something else? A great discussion ensued, no surprise, that's an internet forum after all. But at their core, worker placement indeed consists of a simple mechanism, a system of available actions whose choice by the players is mutually exclusive. That is to say, if player A chooses a determinate action, say gain wood or convert two ore into swords, player B cannot take the same action in the same round. This is, after all, what makes worker placement games different from, say, action selection ones, where the number of actions you can take every round is similarly limited, but when mutual exclusivity is not a factor. But if worker placement is in itself such a simple concept and it lies at the core of many popular games, how is it even possible that many games can proliferate and coexist as worker placement games and being recognized as such and yet being produced in numerous and numerous copies? Theme certainly plays a part. But most of us don't look forward to play iteration of the exact same gameplay system with differently named parts. Designers use the worker placement mechanic to limit the options available to the players not only in absolute terms, but also competitively. This almost seamlessly generates difficult decisions for the players, but what those decisions are about is exactly what makes every game different. To try and exemplify the possible differences among worker placement games, we're going to quickly dissect two of them. The first one is Kalus, designed in 2005 by William Attia, arguably the first proper worker placement game in the modern sense, and Ryan Stern's all-time favorite. In Kalus, better and better buildings and therefore better and better worker placement spaces become available throughout the game. But what makes it very tense, besides its quite generic, in my opinion, race for efficiency, is the tension of the competing vectors of new buildings and the movement of the provost. Basically, actions that you take will only be enacted and made effective if they are before the famous provost, a piece on the board that is moved in agreement by different players contributing money to its movement. This inclination towards efficiency is absent or at least reverse in Stone Age, the gateway worker placement designed by Brunhofer, published in 2008. Here, the variety on the I place here and I take this action is inserted in the form of random returns for your workers. You have way more workers, you place them in groups, but what makes it different from Kalos is that you are never sure of what the return will be because of a random return and not simply because of the interaction with the other players. The two games couldn't be more different, therefore we have to understand worker placement as a very clever, very useful mechanic, but as usual just one of the many 
that concur to our enjoyment of a game that is very different from others sharing that same mechanic. Thank you for listening. This has been Jackie with The Gaming Biopsy. Hey, Eric, can I talk about something that's not a board game but really is? Uh, sure. Well, it's my show, so I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, but... what would you do if I said no? I don't... <laughs> That's a leading question, man. Okay, so <laughs> I want to briefly talk about Civilization VI. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, now this was this came out for the computer, and I just wanted to give some of my thoughts on this because, and and I don't don't worry if you're if this is your first time you've ever listened to the show. I don't know that I've ever really talked much about computer games other than in passing, but Civilization has always really been a board game on the computer. Mm-hmm. It really has been, and it's been a spectacular one. I love Civilizations. I loved all of them. Here's my order of my favorites. Civ 4, Civ 2, Civ 1, Civ 3, Civ 5. Yeah, sorry. I'm not a big fan of the, the Civ 5 as much. But I like them all. But Civ 6 is inching towards being number one on that list. Wow. Yeah, I really like the new one. So Civ 6 took a lot of things from Civ 5. Instead of having squares, it has hexagons. If you don't know what Civilization is, it is a game in which you – Take a civilization and you start in the very beginnings of time with nothing except maybe you have a hut and then you go all the way up to where you are – have a gigantic nation and you are sending uh, colonization to Mars. Mm. And so this takes a lot of the aspects of Civilization V, which had hexes instead of squares and it had – it didn't let you put like 200 units in one spot. Eric, have you played any of the civs? Uh, I, the only Civ I've played was Civ Revolution, which was the the simplified iOS version. I cannot even talk to you about this then. But I'm sorry. Th- that, the Civ Revolution is kind of like Civ Five. I remember playing Civ Revolution and thinking, it's for kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm such a snob when it comes to the <laughs> Civ games. Uh, it's it's fine on the iOS, but I want some deep gameplay. And this new Civilization, I really love how deep it is. For example, uh, there's only nine governments in the new version. However, when you pick a government, it has slots in it, and then as the game goes by, you are collecting cards, and you fill these slots in the in the, in the the government. So let's say, for example – and I don't have this stuff memorized, but let's say I pick democracy, and that gives me one military slot and three economic slots and some wild card slots. And so I'm like, oh, OK, I'll take 50 percent off production of tanks. That's my military thing. And I like that a lot because it really lets you customize your government. Hmm. You can also really customize your religion too. I started at the religion of board gamia. <laughs> okay. And so I was watching board games be spread from land to land, competing with the Protestants and Islam. Board games were <laughs> – oh, the world was converted. I'm not trying to be sacrilegious. It was more silly than anything else. Uh-huh. But uh, it was I, – I really like that aspect. I like they, – they have the, the city now – you build sectors outside your city, and then in those sectors, you can build certain kinds of buildings. But you can't build every sector in every city. In the old civilization, I just built every city, everything, for the most part. And one city had all the wonders of the world. <laughs> Come to Dice Tower and you know Landia, and you know there you'll have you'll see the pyramids and you'll see the great statue <laughs> and all this stuff. Well, in the new one, you could. It makes more sense to spread them out because they take up a spot in your city. And you know, if I put all the wonders, I have nowhere where the farmland can go. And <laughs> right, know, the other it becomes a very poor go. city. Right, so that's kind of a neat thing. the The graphics, of course, are phenomenal, and the music and everything is great. My biggest, the biggest weakness with the game is the weakness that Civ has always had, and that's that apparently they allowed an insane person to design the computer opponents. Because they just act they're, – they're, they're, they're stark raving mad. Mm. They'll be like, ah, uh, we don't like the fact that you're richer than us. We're attacking you. And I'm like, what? Are you – like a turn ago, you said we were peaceful. <laughs> and I mean you can make an argument that that's how some world leaders have acted throughout history. Yep. But they're all kind of crazy and they're all constantly attacking. But I, I got sick of it. I In my latest game, I, I took the war to Gandhi and – and just beat the snot out of Gandhi. Mm. Not something most people would say proudly, but I was <laughs> proud enough of it that I took a picture of it and saved it to my phone as he hung his head in defeat because I was so mad at him. Um, he started a war. I forget why we started the war, but I was just really irritated. He started it. I finished it. 
Um, but the combat is good. So the leaders thing is kind of the biggest weakness of the game. It runs a little slower than the Civ Five, but that's probably because it's taxing the power of my computer, probably more so. Yeah, probably. Uh, I do enjoy it, though, and it's that same problem every Civilization game has. I start playing it, then I'm like, what? One more Four turn. hours just went by. It is unbelievable how immersed I get in these games. So I would, like, do a couple turns, then I'd be like, all right, Tom, go do this. So I go do that, then I run back and do a couple more turns. Then I go do something else, because that's the, uh, that way I wasn't, like, so immersed in the game. Like, I'm talking about now, and I'm thinking, well, we're almost done recording. I could <laughs> I could. I could stay up and if if we and, hurry up and finish this episode, I could I could get a couple more turns in before bed. And yeah, I mean, I got some free time this weekend, and uh, I did have free time, <laughs> so it is really cool. There's still some things that it does not allow yet that I think will be fixed in patches. Like for example, I couldn't name any cities. It just they just uh, named them themselves. So so far, I've only played America. I played Theodore Roosevelt. I'll put, you know, so I had, you know, New York and Boston and all that jazz. Right. And I'm, I'm going to pick another civilization and run that. But I like to name my cities different names. Like I would love to name a city Dice Tower. You know, I usually name the, the headquarters is usually Dice Tower. And then I pick the cities I've lived in, Weejambu and Pensacola and Miami. And mm-hmm. then I pick things like Summerland and Melodyville. And, and then you sack that one, I guess. Yeah, okay. But this game did allow me to name units, right? So I had the Healy Boys of Death. <laughs> you know, they were a, a chariot unit that did well for me, and then they eventually became a tank unit. And I just – I was naming different units after my kids, you know, and mm. I had Amy's Battleship of Doom. And so I just had all these different things. I don't know. I, I really like this. It's it's such a good game. It really is. And if you like board games, I really think you would like this. Um, so I highly recommend Civilization VI. Cool. Now it's time to aim for the sweet spot with Glenn Flaherty. Hi everyone, this is Glenn Flaherty from the Sweet Spot, and today we're going to talk about Dicey Goblins, Kitty Paw, Lame Is, Moonquake Escape, and Delve the Print and Play. So, Dicey Goblins is a game that fulfills the promise of Zombie Dice and Dungeon Roll. It's a real multiplayer experience. Uh, it's like Zombie Dice in that you're rolling dice and you're trying to survive and get the most. Um, uh, coins or eggs out of a dungeon. It's like dungeon roll and that you're trying to barter your situation to make it through. It becomes interactive because everyone in the group is deciding uh, if they're going to go in or if they leave. And if they leave, they get some treasure. But if too many people leave, they can't split it. They have to take a little bit. And if a red dice come out, you don't get treasure. You actually steal it from another player. Dice of Goblins, that's a total hit of a game. Go get that one. I think it was a great time every time I played it, and I think your group will like it. Also, there's a game called Kitty Paw, and Kitty Paw is kind of mind-bending. It's this game that has uh, these little cats in different orientations. Some are sleeping, some are long, some are awake, some are short, some are in a litter box. And uh, basically what happens is you all get these cards, you flip it upside down, it has a certain arrangement, and you need to arrange these cats in that pattern. Um, I think it would be great for kids. Uh, You'll have a lark with it, opening up your game nights with it a few times. Um, It's in one of those boxes that kind of looks like it's, you know, like some seaweed candy from the... uh, Asian food store, or something like that, with a cat waving, you know, for good luck. Okay, also let's talk about uh, Les Mis. Les Mis Arab is a little card game, and in it you are killing people, saving people, and trying to score points. You're trying to be the most successful. Sometimes you even have to sacrifice a character. And basically what you're doing is you are uh, either drafting a card or playing a card, trying to set up scoring opportunities later in the game. Uh, I think it plays up to four people. I actually had fun with it. You don't do any anything in the first half you don't score you're plotting and then all the scoring happens in the back so take a look for that one Les Mis see if that's up your alley I thought it was up mine uh, let's also talk about Moonquake Escape Moonquake Escape is kind of like a uh, cross between lift off where aliens are trying to get off of a uh, planet before it explodes and there's a moon and it's crossed with munchkin so there's a little bit of take that uh, you're trying to get to the final stage it also has a board very similar to that new game uh, Daedalus Sentence where it's this big 
big round board and pieces are moving like this back and forth. So if you like those games, uh, Lift Off and Munchkin, you're going to like this one. Essentially, uh, in Moonquake Escape, you're all aliens trying to escape. You're trying to move into these different areas. You're trying to shoot each other, expose each other, slow each other down, take your uh, weapons, take their weapons, and try to avoid getting captured by a security guard. And the last thing is Delve the Print Play. I am a fan of one-page print plays. I thought this was pretty good. Check it out in Board Game Geek. If you have a suggestion for a good one-page print play, please let me know. My Twitter is at Games and Bourbon. That would be great. Anyway, uh, check those out. Dicey Goblins, Kitty Paw, Lay Miz, Moonquake Escape, and Dell. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Any truth to the rumor that nothing personal is just a reskin of Click Clack Lumberjack? Why are you so mean to your co-host? All right. Best food. Origins or Gen Con. And now the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, 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 Tom, uh, uh, which way to the bathroom? Chris says uh, often when we're discussing a new game, we'll state that it's from Stronghold or Rio Grande or whoever it is that the U.S. publisher of the game is. However, the game is frequently initially published in Germany or another country with a different distribution company. Whilst it's not uncommon for each publisher to vary a game slightly, typically 99% of the game's development after the designer is done is undertaken by the original publisher in conjunction with the designer, and the secondary publishers are unlikely to have made any meaningful change to the games, and as such, that's the company that builds the reputation for the kind of games they release and the quality of their development. So should you be saying, for example... Village is published by Eggertspiele, with Stronghold doing the donkey work over here in the States. Uh, I know from at least the way I understand our perspective is that we try and do the U.S. publisher first, just for simplicity's sake. Well, actually, I have several reasons for this. First of all, this question that Chris is asking would have sounded better, I think, 10 years ago. Because a lot of what he said is not actually quite true. Like, for example, he said 99% of the game development, blah, 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 is done by the original publisher. A lot of these games are now done jointly by these companies. Mm. Sometimes they were originally done jointly by the companies. And just because it was originally published by one doesn't mean that the new publisher doesn't have any input on it. Secondly, it is totally confusing as to who was publishing whose game first. Mm. All these publishers are out there now. It's no longer German first, then American. Sometimes it's Japanese, then American, then German. Mm. You know, sometimes it's French and then Italian. I mean, it's it's very, very confusing. So this is what we do on the Dice Tower for simplicity's sake. We mention the name of the people who sent it to us. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right? They're the ones who sent it to us. So they're the ones who get mentioned. I don't know if Eggert Spiel did it, if it was sent to me by Stronghold. I mean, it might say that on the box, but it's just a lot easier. Also, we say that because our audience is English speaking. And so we are telling them this is the company to look for when you're getting that game. And so I'm not trying to cut out any original publisher or anything, but we're, we're, we just got to do it that way because I'm, sometimes I'm not even sure. You go to Board Game Geek, you'll see 10 publishers. And I'm like, well, who's the first publisher? Mm-hmm. And, oh, whatever, you know, this game came to us from Mayfair. We're saying Mayfair did it. Um, It's kind of a big confusing mess sometimes, but for us, if a company sends us the game, they're the ones who paid the money to ship us that game. So True. I think they're the ones who should get the credit. Yeah. Now, sometimes it's a joint effort. And, for example, with Eggert Spiel, in like a recent game, I uh, or, 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 or let's take uh, Terraforming Mars. That was Frick's Games and Stronghold Games. Mm-hmm. They, they worked on that together to get that out, uh, and I did mention Frick's games because I just happened to know that, but I don't always happen to know these things. So we're not trying to be U.S.-centric at all, per se, and if another company outside America sends it to me first and then a, a company picks it up, like um, I'll be reviewing that new chariot racing game from Matt Leacock, mm-hmm. and I got that from, uh, I got that from uh, Pegasus. So I'll be mentioning Pegasus when I do that one rather than Eagle Griffin, who just kickstarted the game. Gotcha. Uh, Steve says, I have a good friend who I've been slowly introducing to the world of board games with games such as Avalon. I think he means Resistance Avalon? Resistance Avalon, yeah. Yeah, and Dixit. Anyway, she has been coming to a game night or two, and she said she wanted to bring one of her favorite games. She was very excited about this, and it was a mix of Uno and Gin Rummy called Phase 10. (laughs) Steve says, I know what the views of this game are amongst hobby gamers. 
I don't know. I, I think it's a fine game. And I fear the response you, wait, what? should— what? Okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, and I fear the response should she produce it at the next game night. How can I tell my friend that this may not be the best game to bring to a game night as it is looked down on somewhat without permanently alienating her from the hobby? That is a good, hard question. Uh, yes, it we is. We have someone in our group who did this for a while. He brought Monopoly and Life and other games. And I was like, hey, that's that's cool. Set it up and we'll see who plays with you. And a couple people did play with him. And I was like, whew. <laughs> yep. Because I didn't want to – because I don't want to mock other people's games, right? I don't want to play them either per se. Right. But if your game group's big enough, you're fine. I think this is one of those instances where I would actually bring it up to the game group and say, so and so is bringing this game. Does anyone not hate Phase 10? <laughs> Will you play it with her? And right. then let's find a game that's similar and teach that. Yes. I, I, I think it's important to give her the opportunity to play it once. And with a small player count, you can get through a Phase 10 game not terribly slowly. As long as you pick, like, two or three other people to say, all right, we're going to do this. And then, then you've played that game with her, and you can move on to something else. But I don't think it's a good idea to shut it down completely. And this is what I would do because I like to be devious. I would then play some small games like Phase 10 with her. And if I found – and then she's like, I really like this one. I would buy that game for her. Mm. Then she would bring that game with her to game night. And then she'll get people to play it with her. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, and this might progress naturally. She might then start buying games on her own, and then you're like, oh, this is great. She's buying better games. But, you know, I that's, that's what I would do. Noel has a related question. Have you ever been in this situation, he asks. You're at a game gathering with people you've never met before. And to break the ice, you ask someone, do you want to play this game? And the response is, Ugh, I can't stand that game. It's just Wait a dice. Minute. Is this an answer to the last question? <laughs> More or less. It's just <laughs> dice chucking and drawing cards at random for an hour. The, the game is so dependent on dumb luck that you might as well let your golden retriever choose your actions for you. I'd rather drink vinegar out of a rusty exhaust pipe than play that game. The vehemence of the response can make things awkward for the person who asked, right? Personally, when a stranger asks me about a game I happen to not like... I don't feel the need to say much more than, I'm not a fan of that game. For the same reason, I don't introduce myself to strangers at a party by saying, Hi, I'm Noel. I can't stand, insert sports team, and I'm voting for, insert presidential candidate. When you're in this situation, do you err toward brute honesty or cautious restraint? Well, I really feel like the answer there, that's like a leading question, right? <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> no, I shut um, down everything immediately. No, I will say that I, 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 this is something I, I have to be for myself. I have to constantly think about. Someone called to me like, hey, do you like DC deck building? And I have to be like, Tom, shut your mouth. <laughs> you know, right? Because I have to be very cautious because no one likes to hear their favorite game disliked. Right. Because I, I feel like I have a pretty thick skin. And if I say, hey, man, you know, the Cosmic Encounter, someone's like, garbage. Mm. Like, well, you shut up. <laughs> yeah. I like cosmic. You know, that's your natural response, right? Yeah. So if if I think that, then the other people are going to think that. So I have to be very, very careful in, in this regard for me. Eric is brutally honest, though. Oh, sure. Yeah, all the time. No, uh, I mean, we've talked about this before as um, a way that we can accidentally turn people away from our hobby. You know, when someone's just like the, the Phase 10 thing, somebody comes up and says, I, I like Phase 10. This is my favorite game. And you respond with, Oh, my – oh, don't you even listen to what Tom Vassell says about that game? Oh, my goodness. Why do you carry around that garbage? That is a – that's a direct attack on something you love, and that can really turn people away. Whereas a more gentle – well, that's not really my thing. I, I like the way this game does that sort of set collection better. That's a much more gentle and uh, amicable – response to that sort of thing. And and I think we sometimes fall into the trap of being critics all the time. And, you know, when some when a game is brought up, we're trying to find the flaws in it and pick it apart as as much as we can. And and when you're with 
like diehards in the hobby, that may be the subject of discussion. But when you're with a more mixed group, uh, that can really be off-putting to be so negative to certain games. So I, I think it's it's important to remember how it comes that, across if you're that negative. Right. That's true. When I'm hanging out with Sam and Z and other diehard gamers and they say something about the game, I'll be like, garbage. Yeah. You know, right. Because we're just, we always say that sort of thing to each other. But that's different. That's a very different situation. Um, Matt wants to know, why don't publishers pay more attention to the shuffleability of cards? That sounds like a good word. I agree with it. It seems to me that card-based games, especially set collection games, should put shuffleability as a very high priority. Yet I own many games with stiff, difficult to shuffle cards, like the original Ticket to Ride, which also has ridiculously tiny cards, or my early copy of Morels. He says, I can do it right. You can do it right, as games as Fairy Tale seems to have cards that are both durable and easy to shuffle. I'm assuming it's a cost thing, but do stiffer cards really cost that much less? Well, first of all, the original Ticket to Ride small cards was replaced very quickly by bigger cards. Mm-hmm. So I don't notice this as much about like thicker cards. The only time I notice it for me is when they decide to use something like plastic cards mm. or cards that – stick together more, yep. then I notice it. But for the most part, and Ticket to Ride cards, those, weren't those linen finished? I, th- I didn't think Yeah, I, I never really shuffle. thought of that. as Maybe it's the size that's the issue. But I think I finish is, is a bigger thing. You know, linen finish versus just a flat matte finish uh, can be a pretty big difference in feel and quality as well. I love linen finish. I would linen finish my computer if it made sense. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. But I think yeah, to answer may... his question, yes, cost is a major issue. Didn't you say, Tom, that putting linen finish on cards can like double the cost? Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen. I work with publishers sometimes on these things. And where was it recently? I was looking at the cost of the cards and the linen. Oh, I know what it was. It was when I did those Kickstarter money cards. The card money, the yeah. campaign. And I was like, how nice do you want them? Here's the nicest version. And I was like, whoa, okay, never mind. You know, let's move. What's the, the – not the second. Let's go down to the fifth Let's go two version. or three steps down from there, yeah. <laughs> so it's unfortunate that that's the way it is, but – yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah. But Matt also said he read some early written reviews I did at the Kinesia game Spy and the Michael Shocked game Drive. And he says I'm very I was very positive about those. Judging by your more contemporary reviews, he thinks both those games wouldn't be quite so positive if they came out today. If well, let's talk about that first. Um Spy was a Uber play. Well, what was it Uber play? It was the Simply Fun game and i would probably give that one the same rating today i don't think i raved about it i thought it was a nice fun two-player game drive on the other hand i still really like uh drive has been redone multiple times it was originally crazy chicken the latest version of it was a samurai theme i don't know if you played any of these games eric uh, no. I... Drive was essentially where you're collecting sets of cards and you would play them in front of you, but you had to play more cards than someone else did. Hmm. And you would take that set from them. Okay. Well, well. anyway, I really like it. I just played it a year ago. So, yes, I think it's fine. Anyway, he says, do you think filler games of today are much better than filler games of 10 plus years ago? I don't think so. I mean... There's no thanks is still an amazing that's, game. That's true, yeah. Um Can't Stop, is that a filler game? It's pretty close to one. Yeah, sure. You know, is I don't think Bonanza is a filler game. No. Uh, but oh Six Nymph is. Yeah. And that well, one's pretty strong. I don't think so, do you? Yeah, I don't I don't think necessarily. I mean, there's always something new in that sphere, but I don't think necessarily new designs are better than older. Right. Matt says, I think fillers of the past have a harder time aging gracefully as compared to their heavier counterparts. What do you think? I think it's the opposite. I think the heavy games age worse. Filler games are like usually just a mechanic or two. They seem to age much better. Right. I think the more moving parts you have in a game or the more uh, reliance on components you have in the more complex games – they're not going to age as well as technology and, uh, you know, the, the interweaving of mechanisms continues to evolve. 
Whereas with a filler, it's pretty straightforward and simple, and that can still stay strong as years go by. Stephen has a, an interesting comparison. We talked about evolution of components just a second ago. Uh, so when Stephen was first getting into the hobby, wooden resource cubes were the standard component for representing resources. And occasionally you'd get wooden bits that were shaped to look like what they were meant to be. That was that a company was going above and beyond on production quality. These days, wooden bits shaped to look like what they were meant to be are closer to the standard. Uh, resource cubes are only used in very specific circumstances, like if you need everything to feel the same in a draw bag or something. And increasingly, uh, if you use just plain cubes, it makes a game's production look cheap. Since board game production quality is increasing all the time, do you think we'll get to the point where shaped wood, where there isn't a mechanical reason for it, will start to look cheap? With the need for detailed wooden resources like meeple source productions or the resin sculpts from Stonemeyer Games, that will be what we start expecting from a board game standard production? I don't know. Maybe. I, I will say I think the game, to me, the game that kind of changed all this was Agricola. Mm-hmm. Because when Agricola first came out, it was there was cubes for the sheep and the the cattle and the pigs. I remember that. And then... Zev did the the pre-order, which would be a Kickstarter today, but he did the pre-order, yep. and it was like, if you buy this, you get wooden animals. And everyone was like, berserk. Yeah. What? Wooden, wooden cows? And now it's kind of mind-boggling to think that the the wooden cubes was e- is even a possibility. Right. right? Yeah. If, if a game came out today that had animals in it and there were wooden cubes, I would say, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of which, Eric, did you did you go by the stand at Essen that has all the little wooden pieces? Oh, uh, I missed it. Yeah, I always go hunt it down, and I always look at it. But this year, I did not buy anything. <laughs> but I looked at them, and I thought about buying stuff. Mm-hmm. But they just have drawers and drawers of different wooden pieces. I love it. I'd need to um, hit that stand with, with a, a list. Like, if I was to do that, I'd need to know, all right, I'm doing this game, which means I need eight cows, and I need 16 chickens, and I, so I, I can't just go there and say, eh, this looks pretty. How many of these do I need? <laughs> yeah, I think you're right, probably. But see, you don't know what they have either, though. Right. So you need to go back to back years. One year you go, figure out what's there, then you go home and figure out what you need. Exactly. Or do a whole bunch of uh, international texting. Or, or, yeah, or you just go home that night and think about it. Right. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, those, those wooden things are becoming more and more noticeable. Uh, I was just playing a game the other day that had w- wooden animals. Oh, the new um, Mi Tierra game had little wooden animals in it and, and had little wooden fruit and vegetable pieces. It just kind of that, – that's the way it is anymore. Cubes mm-hmm. are still used in games for sure. But I think we're seeing a whole lot less of them. I, I think it's a bigger jump. I mean, going from standard cubes to pieces that look like what you're talking about, that's a big jump. Now you have a representative specific piece that represents a pineapple as opposed to a yellow cube. But I think going from a yellow plain painted pineapple to a very detailed painted pineapple or a resin pineapple isn't quite the same difference. You still have a piece that is specific to that resource. And I don't know if you need to make quite that same jump in order to, to be a standard component. I think the, the resin stuff, the, the very finely painted stuff is still going to seem exclusive, a, a, a cut above. And I, I think we're going to see standard wood for a while. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to agree with that. All right, let's do one more question from an anonymous player. Uh, They have a game group where people are quick to understand games, and they're good at them, making it challenging to play them. And and this person enjoys that, but there's two exceptions. They have a player who's really bad. This player does not understand rules, even after playing the group several times. They have to calculate the income in a game for this person every single round and other basic stuff. Um, Finally, they say once this person finally learns to play a game, they're an average player, but this takes a really long time. So they don't want to play heavy games with this person, especially brand new games, because they know they would have to explain the rules at least 10 times during the game. It would make a fun experience into an A, analysis, paralysis, horrible experience. However, they have an open group. Anyone can come. And so they hint to her to this person that maybe they should play other games. 
but they do not realize it and keep insisting on playing the difficult games. That this person's uh, friend, boyfriend, I guess I'm just be clear on that, does not enjoy playing games with her, so he usually tries to convince her to not play the game he's playing, which pushes her to play with us. <laughs> and when I do play together, he keeps mistreating her during the game. He's not a nice player, but for other reasons, because he's a braggart. Uh, and he's be, this guy actually is pretty good. And people have interrupted games in the middle because they don't want to play with this 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 guy. It basically sounds, it sounds like this guy's a jerk. Mm-hmm. So the questions are how to deal with both of them. <laughs> how to deal with the bo- the boyfriend who's coming to play and brag, and how do you deal with the other with the girl who's you know how do you tell someone a game's too heavy for them without offending them? Okay, well this first one I deal with. Sometimes I'm yep. someone in my gaming group. I have people in my gaming group who really can't handle heavier games. And I'm like, all right, you know, oh, they're going to ask these questions 200 times over the course of the game and they're going to really drag it out. Right. So I always am very upfront. I'm like, you can play this, but I want you to realize this game is a very complex, heavier style game. Okay, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in this game. It can be very difficult because sometimes I'll sugarcoat a game when I'm trying to get someone to play it. Like, right. oh, it's not that bad. I go the other extreme here. And if they still want to play it, well, that's, you know, it is what it is. And uh, then I will actually make sure my game's filled up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Okay. With the guy, I think I would actually talk to him and say, listen, no one likes when you're bragging all the time. Yeah. Well, I think of the two personalities you've got to deal with here, the second one is the worst. Uh, you know, you can deal with somebody who has trouble learning games. You could you can print out player uh, reference cards. There's lots of resources on BoardGameGeek if you're able to prepare uh, for that eventuality that you think she's going to want to sit down at this game. There are player resources that you can bring in that will hopefully help out. Um, and eventually, as you said, once she grocks the game, it's 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 going to be an easier experience. The bad attitude player is much more difficult to deal with um, because of the fact that this guy is winning a good portion of the time. Um, it's just re it's it's self fulfilling his braggadocio, and uh, and yeah, you need to have a talk with him and maybe the group on on you know, a good attitude. It's also sort of annoying that he keeps insisting that his girlfriend play on a different table. If he knows that she's going to slow things down a little bit, that he insists she sits somewhere else so that he can move faster. That's, that's pretty jerky too. Yeah, I agree. Sorry. I cannot approve of this. Yeah. But it is also, it's a very difficult situation to deal with. That's definitely for sure. All right. Well, that's questions for today. Folks, we are in desperate need, not of questions. I mean, we always can use questions. You can send them in. But we're in desperate need of tales of horror, tales of uh, amazement, tales of treachery, tales of joy, tales of sorrow, mostly tales of horror. But if you have one, send them to us at dicetower at gmail.com. It's time for the Dice Tower's Question of the Week, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., in which our team of gaming experts answers one of your questions, thus increasing the odds that someone will get it right. This week's question, have you ever purchased a game on a whim without knowing anything about it? This is Jared from Flip the Table. Uh, I was a big zombie game fanatic, and I went to my local game store and saw Last Night on Earth. I looked at the box, looked at the art, and I was like, sold. Never regretted it, even to this day. Hi, everyone. This is Glenn from The Sweet Spot, and I've totally done that. And I've done that with games, clothes, records, products, and probably a vacuum cleaner. Uh, it looks cool. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this would be awesome. So I pick it up, burned every single time. So for that reason, I'm really weary of doing it. And when I do do it, I try to keep it to a low price point. So one day I'm walking in the store. I see Ties of Time on the shelf. Never heard about it before. The box looks cool. The price was right. Brought it home. Total winner. So that time worked out great. Hey, everyone. It's Mark Zolinski. And have I ever bought a game without knowing anything about it? Of course I have. And where do I do that? Conventions. And where do I usually get in this much trouble? At the auctions. That's right. 
So, I mean, that's a great place to pick up games, super cheap. You just walk through there and, you know, people are just dumping games and a lot of them in the shrink wrap and, you know, which is fantastic. So you get a new game, you get it cheap and you get that experience of being Tom Vassell and getting all these games that you have no idea what they're about. And then you open them up, play them and find out which ones are the diamonds in the rough and which ones are the stinkers. Hello, hello, this is Ignacio Cevjek, Portal Games. Stephen Bonacore, Stronghold Games, we are Board Games Insider. And the game that I bought without doing any research was 1812, The Invasion of Canada. All I knew was that the game sounds interesting, this is a game by Academy Games, and that I love war games, but I have no idea about them, so I just bought the game, and I didn't regret it. I, I've probably done this many, many times, and you know, especially with small games, because you know you want to listen to another card game or something. But I certainly remember doing that with uh, Chaos in the Old World. You know, Eric Lang, great designer. It was just it, it was crazy theme. You know, so I love the games with theme. So absolutely do that. We're gamers. You know, this is what we do. This is Anthony from Board Gamers Anonymous, and a little over a year ago, I picked up The Voyages of Marco Polo, knowing absolutely nothing about the game. I did not realize who the designers were. I did not know anything about the mechanics. The only thing I knew about this was that somebody on Board Game Geek had compared it to a mix of Terra Mystica and Kingsburg, two of my favorite games. Now, in the end, it is nothing like a mix between those two games. It's very much its own beast, but happily, it also became my favorite game of 2015 and is probably one of my favorite Euros right now, even with the dice. So that was a really happy surprise, especially after it went out of print and was so hard to find for so long. The Voyages of Marco Polo, my blind pick of last year. Hey everybody, it's the Board Game Point of View, and we have purchased a few games without knowing much about them. I had a less than pleasant experience with my purchase of Small World. I looked at the box, it looked amazing, the artwork was fun and whimsical, and we just ended up not really enjoying it. On the other hand, Steven and I have bought a couple games on a whim that turned out to be some of our favorites yet, with whole episodes of a podcast dedicated to them. Indeed. We purchased both the Game of Thrones card game, as well as Star Wars the card game, strictly based on the theme... They both turned out really well. So, I guess our advice is stick to games you know, or stick to themes you know. This is Brian from Cult of the Old. I used to do this all the time at the end of a Gen Con. Just buy a random game, just for fun. One time it worked out really well. I asked the Fantasy Flight guy, hey, what's a good game? And he recommended Blue Moon City. It's still one of my favorite games. It's my wife's favorite, which gets brownie points for me. And then one time was really bad. I bought Tannhauser, which is a $60 dice fest. Great theme, great potential. But the objective is what I thought would be cool, but they just became mechanical token things. And that was really disappointing. But still love Blue Moon City. Why? For me, it was just a chance to take, like open up a new pack of cards and see what you got. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Hey there, this is Graham from Four Corners of the Board. Did I ever buy a game on a whim? Sure did. When I first got into the board game hobby, before I found board game reviewers or even board game geek, I would often just look at the cover and buy a game that way. In fact, when the whole family goes board game shopping now, this still tends to happen. One of the early games that I picked up this way was Level 7 Escape because I loved the cover, and from reading the back of the box, it sounded like the Alien series of movies mixed with modern horror movies. Dark, horrific, atmospheric, and a battle to stay alive, plus it was semi-co-op. I mean, what could go wrong? Let's just say it didn't live up to my expectations. Hey, this is Paul Owen of Dice Tower News. At a PrezCon auction a couple years ago, I bought the 2003 Uber Play game New England, based on two things. The title, because my mother's family's from Massachusetts, and the designer, Alan R. Moon. And right after I bought it, somebody saw it under my arm and they said it was a terrific game. But it wasn't until recently I finally got it to the table and I was not disappointed. Impulse buys are very rare for me, but my instincts paid off this time. New England. It's Roy Canny from Epic Gaming Night, and I'm actually pretty frugal about these sort of things. I normally don't go and buy games just on a whim. I normally do lots of research, watch lots of reviews from several different people, get an informed decision on whether or not it's a game that I'll actually enjoy playing. If I'm out and about and I see a game that catches my eye, I'll at least pull open Board Game Geek on my phone, check out the reviews on it, or at least the uh, ratings on it, and what the comments are, what people are saying about the game. Um, So that's why I think reviews are so important. So, board games on a whim, not for me. This is Professor Scott Rogers of Biography of a Board Game. And have I ever bought a game on a whim without knowing anything about it? Well, that's what Kickstarter's all about, right? Am I right? 
Actually, the game that comes to mind is a game that I saw at a a little store that was called Nowhere to Go. And it's a little two-person strategy game. It's got this really cool Saul Bass-inspired mystery-looking design to it and these really cool little characters. And it's a nice little puzzle game, um, you know, pretty light, but but it's a cool little, uh, actually, I've never played it. It's still sitting in my closet, and uh, one day I'll get to play it. So who wants to come over and play a game? So that was my choice. Nowhere to go. Hey everyone, Luke from The Broken Meeple. I tend to do my research before I buy any game, really. Well, I'm an accountant, what do you expect? I'm careful with my money. But I'll watch videos, and I'll check out reviews, and play demos, because at the end of the day, a publisher can still make a bad game, and designers can still do wrong. There's no perfect one out there. Isle of Sky is probably the closest thing I've come to buying it on the whim, though, and the reason I did it was because of the awards it was getting in quick succession. I didn't know much about it during its release in sort of 2015 time, but then it won the UK Games Expo Award, and then straight after it won, I believe, the, was it the Kenner Spiel, I believe, the Spiel of Aris, one of the two, and it's like, hmm, okay, barely heard of this one, but it's picking up two awards. I gotta check this one out and see what happens. Well, it's in my top 50 and my top 100, and it sits proudly in my collection, so for once... It was worth just going with my gut instinct. Oh, yes, I have purchased games on a whim. It happens. And and most uh, recently, it happened at Essen. Uh, I was not intending to purchase Bubbly Pop. Uh, I was just, I, I, I was trying to take a crossway through from one section of the hall to the other and happened to go by and glanced over at two people playing this game and was immediately, it, the, the mental process was, oh, that's colorful. Oh, what are they doing there? That kind of looks like Dr. Mario. Is that like Dr. Mario? And I read the rule little synopsis they had in on display card. It is Dr. Mario. Do I really need to buy this game? I know nothing about this game. Maybe I shouldn't buy this game, but I should probably buy this game. I should buy this game. How much is this game? Okay, I'll get it. And I got in line. So, yeah, it happens. And maybe it happens more often than it should. But, you know, most of the time it works out. Most of the time. I'm trying to think here because... I do this occasionally, but usually it's on a on a whim. Like, I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, or maybe it was a month or so ago, someone sent me some old magazines from the United Kingdom about board games. And in there, I found somebody who wrote a whole article smashing Alan Moon for reviewing a truck game. Yes, I, I instantly do remember went that. to eBay and bought that truck game. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do a video review on that at some point. You t- <laughs> Okay. That's the kind of whims that I have, right? Oh, man. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, uh, other games I normally think about. I mean, I used to buy a lot of games on whims. You know, I'd be like, oh, usually it was bargain bins. Bargain bins. I, when I'd go to a game store and I'd be like, 50% mm-hmm. off. I'm like, okay. I Yeah, that seems cheap. Yeah. Nowadays, I'd be like. Well, if it's in that bargain pin, it must not be a good game. <laughs> There's going to be a reason for that, yeah. Um, so, uh, or, or sometimes if I'm at a garage sale and I see any kind of reasonable game, I might just buy it on a whim because I'll be like, well, someone's going to get this game for a good price. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not right. trying to make money, but I mean like, well, that's a good game. I can give it to so-and-so or whatever. What a great, what mm-hmm. a great deal. If I see any decent yeah. game at a, a thrift store or something like that, boom, I'm buying it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have – bought many games on whims when i first got into gaming because i was like i don't know it sounds good that sounds good that sounds good i got more and more discerning as time went by and then digressed as more time went by because now i get sent all these games so whether i want them or not i'm (laughs) I'm, I'm playing them but i will still occasionally see something and go i gotta have that and that seems like that's the end of our episode i think it seems like it yeah okay well if you didn't catch it this week is boardgamegeek.com this week? It is. In wow. While wow, this is posted, I'm on a plane. I don't know. Yeah, you tomorrow I'm on a plane. All right. That's right. You always come in that one day later. But for the first time ever, it will not be as problematic for you for doing that. Oh, good. So anyhow, uh, it's going to be exciting. The gang's going to be there. Eric will be there. I'll be there. Sam, Z, uh, Rob Oren, Eric Herman will be there. That's yeah. Exciting. And... um. A few others will be there. Derek, our video guy, will be there. And so we're going to have a great time. We don't have many scheduled events at all, but we do have a booth, so come by our booth if you want some promos or you just want to say hi to us, maybe have a chance to play games with us. 
Uh, we'd love to talk with you. You might even be able to wrangle us for a meal. That might not be the easiest thing to do, but it might it might happen. It might happen. You never know. But wrangle is a good term for Texas. That's right. But don't rustle us. Or rassle us. <laughs> no, that that may happen. In a manner of speaking. In a manner of speaking. Okay, folks. Well, anyway, if we see you there, we do. If we don't, uh, oh, that's true. I guess we should mention this. Don't look for an episode next week. Okay. Uh, look, we're, we, 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 we don't take many weeks off a year, but we're taking this one off. In fact, is this the first one we've missed all year? It, it very well might be. It becomes such a blur, I'm not even sure. Well, we might have. Okay, but – and I apologize. There's just sometimes we need to take a week of recording off, and this is going to be one of those. So there won't be an episode next week, but we will be back in full force the following week. So uh, don't worry about it. Don't wonder where stuff is. You can always go back. We have a huge back catalog of episodes to listen to. And, of course, there's a ton of other great podcasts in our network. Really, yeah, you can always go back and listen to an old episode and enter the old contest just for fun. Don't do that. Eric, what are you doing? Uh, those the emails, emails go to, to you, not me. Those emails come to me. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, folks. Well, anyway, until two weeks from now, I'm Tom Basil. I'm Eric Summerer. Thanks for listening to the Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 483 was recorded on November 3rd, 2016. Coming up next week, well, you just heard us say we're taking a week off, but we'll be back in two weeks with another top 10 list. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. A giant thank you to everyone who donated or bid in our annual auction. More information at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. An entire bag of dog biscuits for John Arbuckle's pet beagle is provided by A Feast for Odie. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower network, including the Broken Meeple, Start Space, The Game Pit, The Long View, The Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, and Board Game University. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, happy Thanksgiving, and have fun gaming. So, Tom, w- would you mind saying again what you did to Gandhi? Well, actually, my exact terms were I took the war to Gandhi and just beat the snot out of Gandhi. I had Gandhi's head on a pole, but I was uh, proud enough of it that I took a picture of it and saved it to my phone as he hung his head in defeat because I was so mad at him. But I didn't actually do that. The game doesn't let you do that. So I just made him bow before me and say, you win, Theodore Roosevelt, because I can't change my name yet. So I had to be Theodore Roosevelt. But someday he'll say, Tom Rick Vassalini, leader of the Dice Towerians. That's what's going to happen. He started it. I finished it. Good.